Welcome back to Hasbro Side. You see we've completed the mounting now of the scope and, and uh, onto our 6.5 Grendel build. And I had originally painted, uh, coated, or anyway, these uh, scope mounts and uh, scope rings. And they really looked good. But in fact, when I put them on, they were just a little too low and the objective was right near touching the, the handguard here in front. So um, out they go, they'll be on another build. And in comes a Burris pepper mount. And so I really had a hard time getting myself to coat this pepper mount because it looks so nice the way they come from the factory. But uh, nonetheless, I wanted to go ahead and do it. Uh, and I did. So that came out really good. I went ahead and did the three colors that we did on the other, the uh, coyote followed by the desert tan, followed by the uh, earth brown, making the snakeskin pattern on it as well. So that came out, uh, I think, really well and looks good still can't get myself to coat the scope. <laughs> I just can't do it. It would look so cool, but I just can't get myself to do it. So who knows, maybe one day I'll, I'll, I'll decide to do that. Um, another thing on this, if you notice here, that the uh, screws have been uh, coated and they were not before. So what I did was, while I'm coating this, I just went ahead and made a block of wood and drilled some holes, uh, just about the thread size, press them in, and then you can hold them, move them around and coat them very easily and get them uh, coated well without filling in the screw holes and things with too much paint or too much coating. And then I went ahead and did the whole full treatment on it. It got the coyote brown, a little bit of desert or of a yeah, desert tan, and then followed by earth brown to make the snake skin. You can kind of see the pattern there. And uh, when you clock them, they're not perfectly aligned with this, but at least they blend in a lot better. Um, one other thing I did when I put the handguard back on, though, I originally I torqued it to 25 foot pounds, which is just fine. And for some reason, I decided I'm going to go ahead and go to 30 on this. I went to 30, and I think it probably just barely distorted the aluminum handguard. And so it caused the Brownells coating to lift and slightly crack around that um, screw header. It might have just sheared it when the screw head turned, um, but it didn't do it at 25 inch pounds, and that's where I should have stopped. But nonetheless, it's fine. I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but we'll keep an eye on that if I have to. Out come the screws, and I'll just redo that section of coating. Um, but I think it's going to be good, and so we'll see. Um, the other thing I added to this, and I have this on my other ARs now, is something I picked up from Loads of Bacon off the Reloaders Network. And that is, in fact, I think he had a YouTube video which led me to Reloaders Network link, uh, a deflector brake. And so this simply, when your brass comes out and hits the brass deflector, uh, cushions it. And so you don't dent your brass. It makes it a little quieter, and that's good. But the nice thing it does too is when you when it bounces off this, you get a nice pile of brass about two or three feet away from where you were firing, uh, and it's it's a lot easier to gather up. They don't fly nearly as far. So, protect your brass, protect your gun, protect your finish, which is one of the reasons I put it on this one, and then you know it's easier to find your brass. Now, when I'm at the range a lot, I'll probably put a brass catcher that I have on my other guns on this one. It's just easier, but uh, initially, we're just going to leave this on there and then uh, deal with that. But it protects the gun and your brass comes out without any big dents in it, which is always a nice thing to do. So, gun's assembled, scope's assembled, everything's ready to roll, it's oiled. And so tomorrow, uh, weather permitting, this hits the range. In the meantime, let's go over to the reloading bench. Welcome back to a very crowded reloading bench, but I wanted to show you all the different steps we're going to go through on the reloading of our 6.5 Grendel build. Now we may not go through all of these on the first time because the first time I'm really just trying to process brand new brass. I got a bulk uh, brass deal from Natchez. Several different people have it. Natchez seems to be the best deal overall. And it's Hornaday brass in bulk. And so it uh, saves you quite a bit over the boxed version and hopefully it'll be just as good. But it looks all perfectly good. But just to be safe, we're going to go ahead and full length resize it for our first firing. We're going to fire, form this brass though, using the cheapest bullet I could find. And that happens to be uh, the Barnes 140 grain boat tail match bullet. Now it's a pretty heavy bullet for a 6.5 Grendel. Um, it'll be fun, see how heavy it goes. But it's really just to fire form the brass, and so that's what we're going to do. It's a pretty, pretty mean looking bullet, uh, you know, really long, high aspect to it. Very clean, I'm sure, through the air. Very nice pointed tip. And then you can see this, uh, hopefully you can see this, compared to a 77 grain CR Match King. This is CR Match King tipped. 
but it's a you know bigger diameter, longer, and really uh, really slick aerodynamically as you come through the ogive and back to the main body of the bullet, and then a full boat tail at the back. So it looks uh, looks mean. We'll see how well it shoots in the end. But I really got those. They're inexpensive uh, just to process the brass. And who knows? We'll see what we get. We're going to load with 82A XBR. Now this is a powder that's just real. It's a really good powder for a lot of different choices. I've used it a lot in 5.56 um, in the 7.7 grain CR Match King loads. And uh, that has worked out really good. In fact, Johnny from Johnny Reloading Bench is really the one that turned me on to that powder and that bullet combination. Uh, he has just a series of excellent videos on that as well. But that's what we're going to do. Barnes says that uh, on the high end of that bullet that you can get it up to, with 828 XBR, about 2400 feet per second. Well, it's also a compressed load, so we'll probably not do that in the first loads on this unfired brass. And so we're going to start a couple grains off of that. So 26.8 is their top, and so we're going to start with 26.6 uh, and go down in 0.3 increments, down to 25.4. And that should give us a good starting range. We'll start low, and if we build up and see bad pressure signs on the brass, we'll just tear them apart and uh, process them then and, and run them back through at a lower pressure, because in the end, I'm really just wanting to fire form the brass and check the function of the rifle as well. But uh, So Barnes gives a guidance of 2.24 uh, um, overall length, and that's what we're going to do. We'll start there. I won't try to push the length of it just yet. We'll wait. We'll get the fire form cases. And after we get some cases, then I'll start using uh, our, compare, our overall length gauge here and, um, and seat this down in the bore and see what it really is to the lands and see what our jump is then from the maximum, cart, um, maximum um, magazine length to our lands. And we'll get an idea then of how close we are and uh, on a jump. And we'll, tr we'll do that later on, though, but not in this reloading. Uh, the other thing I saw, um, I believe it was Johnny as well on his site, had said that this is a really kind of small primer hole in there. And so I wanted to make sure that the Hornady um, would fit that. And so it, the decapping part of it, it does, it goes right through it. But I wanted to make sure of that because that would be a bad day. You run this down through and to keep hitting a blank and stopping. And so the Hornady uh, works just fine for that. We're going to use also Hornaday lock and load uh, twist lock bushings here. Really like these. Gavin Tube has an excellent review on all the different presses, and in fact, it was due to him that I bought this mech press, and it's just fantastically accurate press. And so I did the same thing he did take the bushing out and, and add in a Hornaday threaded bushing that accepts these uh, twist locks. And so those actually work really well, and we'll be using that for our our dies uh, also. I uh, have the, um, uh, the overall um, cartridge to, to shoulder gauge here as well. This is the, um, the headspace comparator, I should say. I'm just kind of get the right words. Headspace comparator. Um, and for the right one, it's a 350 or the B size. Uh, and that fits pretty well on the shoulder here. And so that's the one that was most recommended that I found on all the forums. And so We'll check that and make sure that we first are within the SAMI spec, and then we'll see how much we're bumping the shoulder once we get our fired brass coming back. I've got the bullet comparator, so we can make cartridge base to ogive as well. We'll check those before we fire them. I'm just going to keep a record of that uh, and check that as well. So uh, then we'll go on and we'll actually do our powder loads uh, here um, using the RCBS uh, Charge Master Lite. And we'll do just typically what I do. I go within 0.1 grains, and then I trickle up, and I do it in two different ways. This is a, one of the cheaper scales uh, that you can get off Amazon, and this one happened to be the one that goes to 0.02 grains. Um, it's pretty good. In fact, it's really good, but it occasionally lose its drift, uh, drift and lose its set point. And so uh, I just always continually check it. You can tell when it starts to kind of behave, and you got to stop, recalibrate, and check it. And so I got this one a while back, and uh, this new new Acalox or whatever it is uh, is also off of Amazon. This one reads to 0.1 grains, but it is really repeatable and just really a nice scale. I've been very happy with it, and it really uh, just extremely rarely has a scale drift error issue. And so I, I weigh them here, trickle them here, confirm them here. 
and then put them in the case. And so sort of three checks. And when I really want to get uh, OCD, I'll pull an OHAS uh, 1010 scale there and check it that way too. And I only do that typically for the um, F-class rounds that I shoot. Um, and I'm not sure it's really worth that step, but I'll do it occasionally for that. This gets me really accurate. Um, and so that, that will show that going, for, going forward as well. I uh, use a Frankfurt Arsenal trickler. Um, there are different ones. I've had the, the cheaper ones. This one is just nice and heavy, and I've been really pleased with it as well. Uh, and then finally what we'll do is back here we have a Sinclair uh, concentricity gauge. And so we'll check run out and things like that on that and just uh, see how our cases and our loads are going. But that makes uh, really more sense once you fire form it. And so we won't be doing that for the first loads. So we'll get everything set up and then start um, with the resizing. Working now on resizing our brand new brass. So normally you don't uh, have to resize the brand new brass, but just to make sure everything's exactly the right dimensions and feeds well in our, our brand new rifle, we're going to go ahead and do that. And so I apply a little bit of you, you, this uh, Hornaday unique case loop to it, and we'll just run it up and down and size all 50 of the first brass we're going to do for the uh, test firing of our rifle. I put quite a bit more lube on them than normal. Um, just because this is a brand new die and um, I just cleaned it out so there are no oil or, or lube inside of that die at all and so I want to make sure it doesn't stick and there's really no issue in fact you can kind of feel there's there's not a lot of sizing going on uh, just the neck and maybe the very bottom of the base very slightly um, is getting sized but and you can kind of see it on the side of the case but it's really not um, too much going on which, which is a good thing that's what we would uh, hope is the case with brand new uh, brass. After a few times there's enough lube in that uh, die now. I can just use what's on my fingers and probably what's just in this for a while. Um, but I'll still just put just a slight bit on here so we make sure that there are no issues and it doesn't stick and one case slightly gets elongated or stretched um, versus another one. So we'll continue on and process our brass and uh, then we'll move on to the next stage. All right, we've uh, resized all of our cases, our first 50, and we need to check overall length uh, before we go any farther and see if we need to trim our cases. So um, should be, according to Hornaday's manual, 1.510, and we're 1.514. Not terrible. Uh, max length is 1.52, so we're okay there. 1.5 one 1.513 and a half 1.513 so they seem to be pretty consistent to the thousands anyway 1.513 1.514 let's see four and a half 512 and we'll check one more here 1.510, so that one's perfect. So I don't see any in a, in a pretty good sampling there of them that'll be too long. So we'll load them up, fire them, and then we'll trim them back uh, to length the next time we reload them. So they, sh they should be fine as they are. The next step in the prepping of our brand new brass is to trim the touch holes. Often when they form these, there'll be a burr inside of here. Some of them are even closed occasionally. And so I have this uh, touch hole trimmer. You can adjust it to length to fit your case, and I've already done that. And you get in there, you feel the start, you just slowly turn it, and it cleans the inside of that uh, touch hole to be just perfect. And so we'll go through and just continue to repeat this and trim all these up just to make sure they're all nice and clean. And really, it'll really help to uh, drop extreme spreads, supposedly. I, I've just always done it, so I guess I should do a test one day and see with and without it if you can measure it or not. But just a good practice. And you can see I'm get already getting a little specks of brass on my hands from uh, bits that are coming out of that touch hole where it has been formed and just a little bit of a burr on the inside, and this cleans it up really nice. So we'll do this to all 50 cases. Then we're going to clean off the, the lube on the outside, clean the cases, and then uh, we'll seat the primers and move on then with our reloading. 
Continuing on now with our uh, reloading of our 6.5 Grendel ammunition, um, seating the primers. The primers we're using for this first round are uh, Remington 7.5 small bench uh, rest rifle primers. And see, so these are really not good primers. We'll also, in this series, uh, shoot CCI 41s, some um, Magnum primers, standard CCI primers. We have a variety of primers we're going to shoot in this, but we're going to start with these uh, anyway. So as we seat these, I thought I'd mention that if you see the tray that we're using, it says Frankfurt Arsenal number four. It's for six millimeter PPC, um, 7.62 by 39, 8K kind of rounds, 38 special, and 357 Magnum. It sits really well, so they fit really tight. Um, there's another tray though that works fine as well, and that's this Frankfurt Arsenal, sort of a universal tray. It goes from I think everything from 17 HMR up to 308, and maybe I think maybe. Um, uh, 300 wind mag, but it has a lot of different stations. So the big station um, Yeah, it sits down there deep enough. It holds it. Okay, but it wobbles a little bit the smaller station though Yeah, it's not too bad. So if you have one of these they'll certainly work just fine this uh, Frankfurt uh, specific one number four um, is probably better. It's you know a nicer fit, but that will certainly work as well. As we go through sizing these, you can feel most of them seat just really smooth and nice and just a little bit of resistance you should expect. I had one though that was pretty tight, um, so they're not all exactly the same. I might run a pocket uniformer on them the next time through, but so far I guess it's just that one, so not too bad. The rest are seating just fine. So we'll finish this and get all of our primers seated and then we'll move on to weighing our powder. Moving on to um, reloading of the powder into our cases, well, we start with a calibration sequence. So what I do is I use three scales to check when I'm working on really precise uh, loads. And so the RCBS uh, Charge Master Lite, I throw, have it throw within 0.1, and then we trickle up on this scale to 0.02, and this scale is a good scale, but it does tend to have drift issues, so you have to kind of watch it. And you can see when it starts to behave and you're, you're wondering, but the best way then is to have another scale that's reliable to weigh it again. So this scale, uh, the new Calox scale, is um, accurate to 0.1, but it repeats really, really well and very stable overall. It doesn't drift uh, much. I've only had drift once, in fact, and so it's been uh, pretty good. Um, but so this one can weigh a tighter, a smaller amount, but you have to watch it. So that's what I'll do. So from here to here, trickle up, there to confirm, and then into our cases. But the sequence and calibration matters. And so what I use is always use the same RCBS scales or weights to calibrate our scales. And so we'll go ahead and zero this, hit the cal button, it zeroes it again. Probably guess I didn't have to zero first time, but anyway, it cal calibrates zeroes it. Hit cal again, and now it asks for the 50 gram weight. And get that right in the middle of the scale platen here, and then hit cal. Now it asks for the 100 gram weight, and so what I do then is try to get these weights to where they're pretty much the center of their two masses is in the center of that platen, because as you move around some of these scales to the edges, you start getting errors, and so um, keep it keep them roughly centered, and then hit cal again. And now we're calibrated on the RCBS Charge Master light. Now I'll take the one scale, the one weight from this RCBS. I always use the same one, um, and then calibrate these other two scales using the same one. They both require 50 gram calibration weights. So on this one, you hold down the mode button and come up and say calibrate, and then you hit this again. It flashes a second, stabilizes itself, and asks for a 50 gram weight. So again, right in the middle of that platen. And it comes back past. Make sure it's reading all zeros, not drifting numbers when they're cold. Uh, sometimes they'll, you'll see these numbers constantly drift. So you've got to let them warm up. That's a bit more of a challenge with this because it shuts off every three minutes. It's really annoying, but, you know, I don't know what it was. It's a $20 scale or something, so you deal with it. Um, so now we take this weight, but we also take this pan. This pan, when I weigh, goes to this scale, and it's the same exact tear over here. So we'll tear it out at zero, and then we'll hit mode, and it flashes 50 grams. 
hit on off once, flashes calibrate, now it looks for the 50 gram weight. So you put that on there and it'll hit the um, um, on off button again. And then it comes back and tells you it passes. And it will typically you'll see it off one or two uh, thousands of a gram. And then it drifts back and it kind of knows where it's at. And so it's perfectly stable then here at 50 um, grams. And so that's all calibrated. Now we just got to set our units back um, to where they need to be. And so we'll hit mode and we'll go to grain. Come back over here. And we're going to hit mode and go to grain, same way. And now we're all set to dispense our charges. So our first charge weight is going to be 25.4 grains of 82.8 XBR. And so on this one, we'll just go 25.3. And then we'll tell it to start. All right, 25.5. So let's see how close it is. We'll move it over to our small scale. This will go ahead and dispense the next one. 25.48. So within 0.02, the RCBS got it. Now, it won't get it that accurately every time, but it does a pretty good job uh, of, of getting us close. So now we're going to go up to 25. Working now on dispensing the powder. We have all our calibrations done, and so we're having the RCVS Charge Master Light throw the powder within a tenth of a grain of our target. Our first target is 25.4, and so it weighed out at 25.3, and in fact, that's exactly what we have on our matches scale, 25.28. And so we'll trickle up carefully here to 25.4. I didn't prime our trickler, so We'll do it that way and trickle ourselves up to 25.4. Went slightly over because I filled that tube too much. So we'll just take a little bit out and trickle back up. 25.4. Now we'll take it over to our, our new Calox scale to check this and just see how we are. 25.4. Typically, if I go 0 0.02 or 0 0.04, slightly heavy in this scale. It's what this one trips to the next digit, so it will be 25.4 uh, even instead of 25.3. But uh, when you use the weight and calibrate them, they'll be within 0 0.02 or max 0 0.04 apart. So then we'll take that and we load our first case. And then repeat. So that one, it says it threw it underweight. Let's see what it really did. Yes, it certainly did. It threw way underweight. So this was still filling the tube. I just really dumped it in and started. Normally you weigh a few charges and get it sort of balanced out. So we'll have to trickle up 0.4. No big deal. So 5.3. Coming up on it. There we go, 25.42. So 0.02 uh, is a little bit high, but as I said, sometimes that will 0.02 high here makes it read exactly right here. So now we have 25.4, and we can be confident in our powder charge. So into the case we go and repeat. So now we have 25.3 on RCBS. Maybe it's starting to stabilize. 25.26, so that's pretty close. And we're going to trickle up to 25.4. 25.42, so 0.02 high again. And we'll come over here to our scale, 25.4, so it repeats. So it uh, works real well, and you have some confidence then in your scales as you go. Twenty-five point two four, so point oh six off on the RCBS. Again, pretty close. And we trickle up. Twenty-five 
25.4 and 25.4 so RCBS is kind of honed in the tube is full now and kind of uh, nice and stable but it does a pretty good job on repeating uh, especially you know, this is 82 8 XBR so it's a small uh, diameter and shorter length extruded powder but it does a pretty good job overall on extruded powders so now we have 25.42 trickling up and what's 0.02 grains among friends so that's the last one of that of that charge and so we're going to move on then to our next charge of 25.7 We'll continue this uh, through all of our pattern, through all of our rounds, and then I'm going to load a second powder, H335. I started just initially with this one, but I, I had some other powders that were good for this um, bullet weight, and so we're going to try that too, and we'll have 50 rounds then, and we can process through our brass also. All right, now switching over to run our second powder, which is going to be H335, but we have to empty out the Charge Master Light. So I thought it might be, I don't know how many people use this or not, but how many useful to you. The way I do it to get all the powder out of here is first put this little cap on. That comes with it. And then second, you can take this air, compressed air, uh, you buy these, I buy these at Sam's Club when it's not insane like it is now and it's not on the toilet paper aisle so you might be able to find them but you can um, get this compressed air and it's nice clean air and you can use it then to purge the entire hopper so you take your uh, jar of powder put underneath here I've already drained the majority of it out and then you can simply uh, pulse air I know turn it upside down because then you get the uh, propellant coming out like a liquid uh, you don't want that but just a light bit of air in there and it cleans it out really really well and then you'll have some still though in the tube and uh, so what you do is you pull this off and just tell it to give you like 55 grams or something like that and tell it to start and what's in that tube then will empty out because the air has filled the tube with what was there when it's done you just hit cancel and then you can dump the powder back out and your machine is clean and ready to reload the next power. So we'll move on and do H335 next. Working our way through our H335 powder loads now, we're just repeating the same thing, uh, setting this a tenth of a grain low and then trickling up. Uh, so far going well um, as, as expected, so we're just working our way up through the system and getting our, our charge weights up closer to our max. And so this is set to 26 0.6 and the first one it throw through with this being uh, new is an undercharge so that's just fine we'll dump it in here and we'll trickle up um, because we're trying to stay shy of our target anyway uh, this particular one is 26.7 so we'll just trickle up until we hit that value or 0.02 above because 0.02 above makes these two scales agree every time 0.02 grains and so a very small amount and so I'm sure it's within the error of the scales themselves. So let's trickle up 26.7 or slightly over. There we go. 26.72. So 0.02 above. Come over to our new Calyx scale. 26.7. So we're good. So we'll continue through these charges. Working our way up. Uh, as we go to our maximum limit, which is uh, 0.3 below the maximum from Barnes, and then we'll move on to seeding our bullets. Moving on now, I'm doing a few basic checks before we seed our bullets. Kind of was doing some mass checks on the bullets. They're supposed to be 140 grains, and in fact, they're all repeating. Uh, the ones I've checked have been all repeating very well to exactly. Uh, 140 grains. Now, this is uh, within a tenth of a grain, the scale I'm using here, but um, it is at least saying that they're all within that tenth of a grain and reading right on 140. And so that, that's good. So the next check, check I need to do is what seeding stem to use. Now, this is a seeding stem that came with a Hornady die. And so uh, just checking it to see which one fits better here and in fact, the the, uh, the one that came with the die fits very well for this Barnes bullet. 
it's very tight really feels secure no wobble at all so I think that's going to be fine this is the Hornaday seating stem for the ELD uh, 130 and 140 grain uh, and Amax bullets and so uh, it fits on there in fact it would probably do just as good uh, but there's just a little bit of movement in there so obviously its profile is slightly different than what the Barnes bullet is doing but I think it would be fine but this is just slightly better so we'll use the one that came uh, from the factory with the Hornady die. So uh, we'll do that now we'll move over to our mech marksman set up our die and start seating our bullets. Alright now we're ready to start actually seating our bullets. Uh, to do so I've, I've got a uh, lock and load uh, 26 size insert from Hornaday so we can measure uh, cartridge base to ogive and so that's all set up I've already checked it against our Hornaday uh, factory ammunition just as a you know sort of a comparison baseline but it won't be the same because the ogive won't be the same here on our Barnes burner bullets uh, but we've done that and then we've also used this to basically set roughly the uh, the the height of the seating stem and so I've, I've, of the die so I've run it down to it just makes contact and then of course back this out and that should be uh, putting us close uh, in the ballpark there. Um, one thing I do want to mention too now that I'm shooting uh, five different loads of two different powders one of the things I do and yeah, other people probably do it too is when I'm done I not only keep track of the sequence but I mark the heads of the, of the cases with two different colors and so one will have one line, one will have two lines, one will have an X, one will have a line and a dot uh, up to I get a combination for five different powders with then two different colors and then on this box I'll put a label and I mark uh, what the colors mean and what the patterns mean so there's no mixing up of the loads I can just look at the head case I know exactly what I have the box gets dropped whatever I'm still good because I'll know exactly what's in there so that's that's uh, that's what I've done uh, I also picked up a couple cases uh, I got a smoke color version of this this is the uh, Frankfurt Arsenal um, 512 box this is for uh, I think it's uh, 6.8 SPC and 7.62 by 39 and it uh, fits this round uh, pretty well and so um, that'll be good it doesn't rattle much and it won't fall out uh, when you're in you know when it's loaded so that box seems to fit um, pretty well and so that's what I've uh, picked up some to use so let's go ahead and seat our first bullet we're going to start with our lowest charge here or excuse me, let's start with our highest charge of 8208 and see how it feels and how it, if it compresses or not so we'll run this up in here we'll check our overall length all right you can see we're way way long but that's the way to start to be safe zero our calipers and we're looking for the 2.24 overall length and so we're at 2.550 and so we have quite a bit to move and so um, we'll bring this on down that should be a hundred thousands and we'll just sort of carefully come up on our number of 2.240 so that's 2.490 so we still have quite a ways to go so we'll continue on we'll go down another full revolution and check it again 2.440 so we have another uh, 200 thousands or so to go but we're just sneaking up on it we'll go down that now we'll go down another half of a turn should be a lot closer now to our final dimension 2.358 Come down again All right, so there were 2.30. So we need to come down 68 thousandths. So each one of these, that's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. That'll be 60. So we should be about 8 thousandths um, shy of our mark. Two point two five zero, which is probably just fine, but we're going to shoot what Barnes said is two point two four zero. What I need to do is actually take this off and re 
position it in the uh, in the locker and just go to the next and then because you can't really see the line to match this so we're just going visually by that line so we've got to come down ten thousandths of an inch so I'll go about what I think maybe just a thousand shy of what I think that line will be and then we'll check it again didn't feel crunchy at all so we should not have compressed it 2.241 and a half all right so we'll come down just maybe a thousandths there and we'll see where we go 2.24 and, and a half so that's fine we'll do that now let's seat some more and see how we average on that because obviously overall length the bullets change a little bit and then we'll check cartridge based ogive in the end Two point two four three. The new case is a little harder to get that bullet to seat right. I didn't chamfer and deburr them because they're they're new, but they're just a little bit tight going in. So two point two four six. I would suspect that's because of that. All right, go in there. Let's just touch it again. See what happens. 2.245. So they're coming out just a little long. We'll do one more. We'll make an adjustment to bring it down. Then probably just a little bit more. All right, 2.242. So let's come down uh, three thousandths. And I think that'll get us close on average for all of those. Be slightly under and slightly over our target of 2.24. So 2.38. 2.43, that was the one that was 2.45. Two point four zero. That one will probably be just a little short because that was our first one that we hit the target with. Two point three eight and a half. So that's fine. So we'll go ahead and seat all of our bullets. That was the highest charge. We'll do the last one here. The highest charge of eighty two oh eight without any uh, crunchiness, not any real c compression. I think it's completely full. Um, but we'll we'll see here. Yeah, there's not there's not any room left in that case that you can detect at least by hearing 2.241. So that's good. So let's move on then to our H335 maximum loads, and let's see what they do. All right, no room in that case either, but no crunchiness. And that one's short, 2.34 and a half. Let's check another one. 2 .2 .2 .2 .2. No room in the case. And 2.230. So with this, with this, we must have been compressing then the 8208 just a little bit because these are seating too short. So I'll use a bullet puller and just tap them to bring them out a little bit, not get them um, not unloaded around completely. And we'll adjust our round then to come back up. We'll come back up about 10 thousandths and let's see how we do um, in correcting that. All right, that one's 2.245, so we've probably gone a little too much. We'll come down just a little bit. Two point two four zero. Try another one. That was a lot longer, 
2.241, so that's hitting our target. Let's try these again. Maybe we are still lightly compressing these at the high end of the H335. 2.247, so these are just longer. These are quite a bit longer. So let's bring this down, and we'll adjust these another five thousandths or so, four or five thousandths, and bring them back in line with what we want. 2.240, It's exactly what we want. This one may have been the one that was short. Let me check that again. Yeah, this one, okay. So I'll bump these down now with a um, bullet puller, just not pull them all the way. Reseat them, and then we'll finish seating all the other bullets. Then the last thing we're going to do is use a Lee factory crimp die. And so we're going to put just a small uh, crimp, a very light crimp. But since this is a semi-auto AR running, it's good, I think, to hold them a little bit tighter. Uh, and so we'll we'll bump that in there, and you can see how the collet collapses, and we'll put a very light crimp on them, and uh, see how that goes. It's interesting. Lee has this is a, a new crimp die I just ordered, and they've changed their lock ring. So uh, we will see. If I don't like it, I'll put another one of these Hornaday lock rings on it because I really like the way they work. But um, all right, so we'll finish loading these rounds, and then we'll see you at the range. All right, we're back in from the range. I'll show the, some of the range shooting in the background as we look at this, but uh, it was a really nasty day and just uh, cold, not good lighting, but it's the only day I had. And so I went out and was able to at least get 10 rounds of our Hornaday Black uh, shot and then our 50 rounds of reloads. Now, this is the brass from that. And if you can see there, um, well, there's really nothing to see. If you look, 8208 XBR is here, starting from 26.1 going up 0.3 to 27.3. And the only thing you see on the 8208 XBR is just here a couple very light uh, ejector swipes or marks from the ejector. Really nothing to worry about. Primers all still look really good and round and no other issues with the cases themselves. But this is the first sign of starting to see um, right there is one. A little bit of pressure on the uh, 8028 XBR. Well, the H335, clean all the way across. Uh, really good brass uh, as far as, you know, no, no pressure signs at all. No uh, primers are all really rounded and there's really no ejector marks uh, to speak of. Maybe actually, maybe one slight smear there, but it, it's very, very light. There's no burrs or anything, but um, so the brass all looks pretty good. Our target, not so much. And I'll show that in a minute. All right, so here's our target. Now, to be fair, the numbers are horrible. And you'll see this. This is a 50-yard target. It's where I started. Um, I fired 10 rounds of Hornady Black in two five-round groups and used that to get the scope on target, or get the scope set up, get the gun on target, to where we can start shooting some groups. Um, yeah, so the Hornady Black, now this is the first round to the gun, so it's probably not so fair, but the first five groups uh, gave me 2491 feet per second average with a 19.3 standard deviation. That's just not good. Well, then the next series after that, the next five out of Hornady ammunition, I get 2181, so very similar, but a standard deviation of 26. So, in fact, uh, with the exception of this one, I'll talk about this, the Hornady Black had the worst standard deviation of any of the ammunition that we shot. Is it the Hornady ammunition? I don't know. I have more in that box that will shoot once the barrel is broken in. It could just be the very first shots are messing with the standard deviation. I think it's entirely likely. Um, so here's the other thing. By way of note or confession, I get to the range, I'm so excited to shoot this thing, get everything set up, get the lab radar all set up, I'm just happy as can be, and I forgot my cleaning stuff. And so if you know when you break in a barrel, there's a lot of people have a lot of different ways, shoot one shot clean, shoot one shot clean, blah, blah, blah. Some people shoot 
five shots. I combine different things from Wilson, from White Oak Armament, different barrels that I bought, and I'll shoot five shots and then clean, and then shoot five more and clean again, and then shoot 20, clean, and then shoot the next 50. Well, yeah, that didn't happen. I forgot my cleaning stuff. And it's, uh, you know, it's a 25 minute drive. I had very little daylight. It was a really nasty, cold day. Yeah, I wasn't going home for all that. Didn't have time. So we have data for 60 shots in a row. The first 10 Hornaday are on another target and they're not shown here, uh, but they were bad. They were horrible, uh, but they were the first rounds to the gun. Um, so yeah, probably not a fair assessment of this target. You shouldn't be doing optimum charge weight studies anyway, probably until you get the barrel broken in, but yeah, it's the OCD nature of me. I just went ahead and did it. I thought, well, we'll see what we get because at least I can say, if I shoot this combination again, I'll probably start within this range for 82.8 XBR and not waste my time on these others, but we'll see. So let me show you the results. First one, 82.8, 25.4, we get a 1.981 MOA. Uh, this is bad. This is really bad. It had a velocity of 2198, average velocity, standard deviation 9.9, .9, so that's respectable. It's not too bad. Low in velocity, but it's a 140 grain bullet, too. And I've started sort of at the middle of what Barnes recommended and worked myself up to just below their maximums. Being this is a brand new case, I backed off a little bit because the case capacity will be smaller. Well, the next one, 25.7 grains of 82.8 XBR, we get about the same result, a 1.994 MOA. And, uh, you know, slightly higher velocity, about 38 feet per second, 2236, and standard deviation of 14.6. So, yeah, not great, but, you know, if it would group good, I, you know, I'd have been happy. And if you see here, you have four grouping really well and one that dropped off. So, may not, all hope may not be lost for this combination. Um, we will test this again. Um, at 26 grains, then, we get a 1.326 MOA. So this isn't too bad. Again, we drop one here. They were grouping decently here. So maybe there's something to be found with this bullet and this powder in this combination. Move on up, though, 26.3, and now it starts to fall apart. Um, so we have 22.2264 velocity, a feet per second velocity, but our standard deviation, standard of deviation just falls apart at 24. Uh, but that's not the worst of the day. Um, so we move on up to our last charge then of 26.6 um, grains then and we see at the high end there we we really fell apart 3.5 MOA. Um, velocity was okay 23.9 but standard deviation is 12. So this sounds good and it grew pretty good but we had one really fall out. This is an interesting round though because it was still within a decent velocity range and it just fell off the map. But we'll have another one to look at here in a second that's not quite so clearly that way. Uh, H335, first round, sorry for my writing here, was 2198 average and our standard deviation was 23.1. Yeah, so not so great. And we get a 2.06 MOA. So, yeah, thumbs down on that one. So we move to the next one, 2604, and we have 2302, 20, 2203 feet per second, standard deviation of 14.1, and a horrible, 2.968 MOA. And we had one that took off and flew up. Otherwise, again, grouping fairly well. But I want you to start noticing these circles, and we'll come back to these, what's going on. Um, we move on up the, on up the chain then, we see a 2.133 MOA, again decent standard deviation, 9.9 .9 and 22.43. So we're moving up slightly in velocity, not a lot for 0.3 grain changes, but we're moving up. Then we move up from 26.7 to 27 grains, and we get a little higher velocity, 22.65, 3.737 MOA. Just horrible. We have one go flying off here. And again, we have some circled, and I'll touch on that in just a minute. The last group, 27.3. Now we have 22.66. Now almost the same identical velocity with 0.3 jumps, so that's good. It's almost like you're looking at a, a node here that we could work with, but yeah, not with these results. 
3.305 MOA um, and uh, 2148 feet per second. I forgot to write standard deviation down. Oh, I'm sorry, it's right here. Um, 2266 average. Standard deviation, 66.7. Well, here's why. This one shot dropped and it was 2148. So, did I mess up a load? I don't think so. I was pretty careful, but who knows? There was one that significantly fell off and it dropped low. But here we started to see some vertical stringing going on as well. So there's something going on in this range that is not favorable for that bullet powder and barrel combination. Now, the round circles. If you look here, there's little lead, ta lead tails and the, circle, the, the holes are oblong. These are keyholing. The bullet is not stable through the entire range. It started here and it was, it was just smaller, a little less keyholing but it's there all the way through and some of these are really uh, pretty bad where we have this sideways smear through here. So none of the 8208 did that. Even at 2198, so you say okay here's 2198, here's 2198 as well. They happen to hit the same value. These are keyholing and these are not. So it has to do with how these powders build pressure and the rate they build pressure or we call the burn rate. And this bullet and this barrel and that powder do not agree at any velocity in anything we tried. So this is a really accurate powder in the Grendel. I've seen a lot of really good reports in that, but for this bullet and this barrel, that powder is out. So I thought you'd like to see this. Uh, that's the results of our just first go out and run some rounds through the gun. Overall, the gun ran pretty good, but I did have a problem with the bolt not fully returning forward on some rounds. It would stop part way. And I think it's a magazine issue. Uh, so I have another uh, C Products magazine coming in and we're going to compare that to the Elander. We're gonna also going to look at and see, well hey, is my coating uh, affecting it? Now I didn't coat too much right where the round set, but I did notice the follower moved up and down really easy. But when I loaded those rounds, that was one stiff spring. And it was hard to get those rounds in there, so I think the rounds are having trouble coming out of the magazine and stopping that bolt. So we're going to try a different magazine. I also have another spring, a JP uh, ground spring. It's supposed to have about 7% more power or something like that. We're going to just throw that in there and see if it helps too. And if it doesn't, then I'll adjust the buffer weights and tear them down. I've got some of the uh, KAK products uh, weights to adjust them and tune that a little bit. But So, yeah, we got our first results to the gun. Uh, some encouraging results here that maybe we can work with, um, but we'll wait till we get our new magazine.